protect and create legacies. And now, here's your host, Daniel Choi. And good morning. It is a new day, and with each day comes a new beginning, a new chance to do something great, learn something new, and enjoy everything this great life has to offer. If you haven't already done so, go to iTunes or Google Play. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can download all of our shows there. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube. You can find all of it under the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi. Broadcasting live again on KCAA 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. Uh, I combine integrity with intelligence to wake you up to things you want to be doing financially. Check out our website, financialwakeupshow.com, or visit us on Facebook and Twitter. That's at TFWUS. If you have any doubt, just reach out. And on every show, we talk about three things. Number one, growing and protecting your wealth. Number two, exit planning, which is selling or transferring your business if you're a business owner or retirement if you're an employee. And finally, estate planning, which is creating a legacy while fully enjoying your money while you're alive. And last week, during the mailbag part of the show, I mentioned that I've gotten four email questions recently about President Trump's policy changes and how they affect the economy and how you want to be thinking about your money. And I didn't get a chance to fully go into details about those questions last week just for, from a time standpoint. So I'm dedicating today, today's entire show to that. Uh, so the Wake Up Now segment for today is what do I need to be aware of in terms of financial concerns and changes that are a result of the president's new policies? And this Wake Up Now segment is going to focus on these topics in a lot of detail because it's really, really important. Part of the show, uh, the concept of the Financial Wake Up Show is to wake up, to be proactive before things go south. So I run into a lot of people and say, wow, you know, if the economy is good, Dan, you're probably really busy in your financial planning practice. And after 17 years now, I can tell you, it's usually the opposite. People actually come less to me when times are good, and they come to me more when they feel they're in trouble or the markets are dropping. And, you know, I think the reason is natural. When things are okay, people feel like they're doing well. There's not much to really pay attention to. It's not like financial planning and financial markets and all this stuff is – the funnest thing to talk about on the planet, but I think it's really, really important to be aware, to invest one hour a week to, to hear about this stuff. And I say all the time, there are people, sometimes very wealthy people, who are financially sick or exposed to financial risk, and they don't even know it. And the reason they don't know it is because they don't feel any financial plan. You know, I've said this before. It's like going to the dentist or a doctor. You go to the dentist when you have a toothache. Well, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a financial toothache. So when things are good, people tend to pay less attention to what's going on. And President Trump has already enacted some significant changes that I think we should discuss today. Uh, if you have any questions about the federal government changes and how this affects you, call us right now, 888-909-1050. That's 888-909-1050. I'll take your questions right over the air. But um, you know, right now, things are considered, from an economic standpoint, to be in a growth-type situation. There are four stages to any capitalist economy, a healthy one at least. And when you see interest rates rise, when you see unemployment rates drop, and, and they've come out with strong numbers recently even, the Dow Jones just hit 20,000 for the first time in history. These are all signs that the economy is stable and growing. You know, interest rates rise to offset inflation, to control spending. Uh, so with that being the case and more interest rates expected to rise over the next year, you could think, hey, things are growing right now and your accounts probably look pretty healthy if they're allocated correctly. Uh, but there's a lot of things also going on in politics and Trump's other executive orders that don't have to do with money where it could be easy to take your eye off the ball around financial issues. And I'm going to talk about some of those today. Two weeks ago, two Fridays ago, I should say, to be exact, President Trump signed orders to roll back legislation called the Dodd-Frank uh, legislation of 2010. It also included a rollback of the Department of Labor's fiduciary ruling, which was announced last year and was supposed to be implemented by April of this year. So I want to explain these regulations, what they were intended to do, and then what the rollbacks mean for the economy. And most importantly, what do these rollbacks mean for you 
from a money standpoint. So after every financial crisis in our country, the government puts in laws to prevent things from happening again. So in 1907, there was something called the Panic of 1907. Uh, there was a rush on banks, and it created the Federal Reserve Act, which created the Federal Reserve Bank, which, are, which is our central bank. Uh, in 1929, that started the Great Depression. In 1933, the Glass-Steagall Act was put into place, which created FDIC insurance which still exists in your checking and saving accounts today. FDIC stands for Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That was because of the crash of 1929. Over the last three, four decades, smaller laws have come out over time to have safer and more regulated financial trading and lending practices for, for people and for big businesses too. So then 2007 comes along, right? 2007, we all, it's still fresh in our memories. Mortgages are packaged up and sold to bigger banks in the bulk, these banks buy these mortgages to make profit off these mortgages. Well, if you remember the mortgages back then, they were written with little regulation, uh, poor credit, paper loans, as they said it, where basically you just write down on a piece of paper what you earned and, and you'd get a mortgage. And there was an enormous amount of risk in those loans and they started underperforming. And when this happened, banks started freezing accounts and money. Okay, Bear Stearns, big, big company, huge, uh, and been around for many years, stopped receiving enough money from clients to stay afloat. So then U.S., the, the, the federal government gives out a $30 billion loan to Chase, okay, and says, Chase, you go buy Bear Stearns and keep it aligned. The next year, Lehman Brothers, which was the fourth largest investment bank at the time, they failed, and at that point, the the whole thing imploded. Credit markets froze, the stock markets tanked, home prices plummeted, real, rental real estate prices plummeted, companies all over that were relying on these debt securities were in big, big trouble, okay? And in addition, during financial crises, there's typically what's called a run on banks. And what's a run on a bank or a rush to banks? It's clients, both individual and businesses, want to pull cash so they can operate because they've lost money in other areas. And the rush on the banks back in 2008 were so intense that companies like General Electric couldn't even access funds to make their payroll. There was a period of time where the Fed broke the buck. What that means is when an investment breaks the buck, it means that for every dollar you put into a cash account, you actually only had 98 cents for every dollar. So imagine putting a dollar in the bank and it's only worth 98 cents. You're like, what? What is that? You know, well, that's called breaking the buck, and that, that's an extremely, extremely concerning development that happened back then. So then Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch. Morgan Stanley got subsidized by the Japanese. Citi was bought. Uh, they, they purchased Smith Barney, which is another big, big firm. Wells Fargo bought Wachovia. All the banks and these companies started merging, and Every single one of them, including some of the smaller ones too, received tens of billions of dollars from the U.S. to get back afloat. And these loans, though, you know, really, they're just a Band-Aid from the government. They're like, okay, well, you can't fail because if you fail, our whole infrastructure could fall apart. So the long-term fix was this Dodd-Frank regulation, which passed in 2010. It was intended to prevent any of this from happening again. So what was the primary thing they wanted to prevent against is too big to fail banks. Because like Lehman Brothers, like Bear Stearns, when they fail, we got, we got problems, right? So banks have to stay solvent. For example, 1929, the Great Depression, that was started as a regular recession, which is the part of, again, any healthy economy. But it went into the Great Depression because banks went out of business in huge numbers. We cannot have that because then all of a sudden the money you need to operate goes away that's how businesses fail. That's how you spiral downward very quickly. So the first part of the Dodd-Frank regulation was to keep a higher level of reserve in cash and in government securities. Now, traditionally, debt instruments like mortgages were part of those reserves. And debt instruments are traditionally considered lower risk. Well, think about it. When you have bad mortgages making up those debt instruments, there's more risk. Okay, it's like buying a junk bond, a bond in a company with low credit. There's bigger upside, but you can lose money on a junk bond. Well, imagine you're doing this with, with mortgages. You have bad mortgages. There's a chance to lose money. And guess what we did? So Dodd-Frank said, you know what? 
you need to have a higher level of reserves in case of a financial emergency in cash and in government securities. Okay, so that was the first part. The second was that they said, okay, we're going to have big banks do annual stress tests. What's a stress test? Well, let's pretend we're in a severe financial crisis. So a terrorist attack, a natural disaster like uh, Hurricane Sandy, which hit the New York and New Jersey areas, a financial stock market crash, something like a Brexit. These types of things, we have to stress test these big companies once a year. So that was part of the ruling as well. The third, let's reinforce some of the regulations from the Glass-Steagall Act back in 1933 because some of them have kind of faded away over time and that led to some of the financial instability in 2007. So let's reinforce some of those. And then the last major piece of Dodd-Frank was establishing the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB. And they have the authority to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, or abusive financial products. So with the rollback, this, all this legislation is at least on pause. Some of it may never get fully enacted at this point. So these four major points that I just brought up, uh, which are designed to prevent financial crises and, and these other issues are on pause and may not be implemented at this point. Okay, so for individual consumers, the biggest effect you'll see is in two main areas. First is in credit cards and loans, and the second is financial products from banks and investment companies. Okay, on the credit cards, in the past, banks have charged fees and penalties if you went over credit limits or missed a payment. And some of those fees and penalties were considered abusive. Okay, some of the credit cards would create interest rate hikes because you missed a payment or went over the limit. A lot of these abusive practices on the credit and lending side were to be stopped with the Dodd-Frank rule. Also, financial products and advice were set to get more regulated, okay, to protect clients and consumers from deceptive or manipulative financial products. So as you know, the devil's in the details, right? So when you look at contracts that you sign, many people, many clients don't read the fine print. Why? It's hard to understand the fine print. There are legal terminologies that people don't understand. I actually like the fine print. I read it all the time. But let's take, for example, annuities. Annuities can be very financial, financially powerful products, but they had very little regulation. Sometimes they had very steep fees. They had surrender periods where you couldn't access the money, sometimes up to 20 years. And marketing techniques that were, in some cases, downright scammy, okay, through these seminars that would target seniors. Well, all of this stopped with new regulations. In fact, a lot of annuities today are the very powerful financial tools that they are intended to be because there's regulation. And Dodd-Frank was to protect consumers from you from, from this stuff, future manipulation of these types of products. Well, that's on hold right now. Now, there is a group, a large group of people applauding Trump's rollback, saying that Dodd-Frank was over-regulation. This overregulating, this too much requirements was crippling banks from what they claim is doing what's right for clients. Again, they were claiming too much is in the hands of the federal government and it's not giving enough flexibility to banks to do what they need to do to be profitable, to make better products, to treat the consumer correctly. So really it's, it's, it's a fundamental shift from having power in the government back to power into the individual banks and companies. Now, people who are against this rollback are saying this is very bad for the long term. Right now, okay, everything seems good, but if we have another financial crisis, these banks could face problems if they make poor decisions. It could lead to another 2007 is what people are saying because some of those banks are going to make bad choices. It's just a fact. So look at Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers. These are humongous companies, huge companies, very reputable around for decades and they went under. So without federal regulation, people against this rollback are saying that could happen again. Again, So banks right now are happy, right? They're very, very happy. Lower reserve requirements means less sitting in cash and interest rates, as you know, have been low. So if you have a lot of money sitting in cash, can't make much interest off of it because interest rates are low. So it's harder to make money on those assets. So now with less rules, less reserve requirements, they can invest in other things that will return better, which is great for now. 
But I always find I learn a lot from my kids and people in general. You know, human beings, we always test boundaries, right? And, the, and some people say, hey, without these regulations, companies are going to test boundaries again. And with poor decisions, you could end up with uh, companies going under again, big, big companies. Now, non-banking companies also uh, like this rollback because you, they have access to money through looser lending regulations. Remember, part of this was to make regulations all across the board tighter. So if companies feel like, hey, I could borrow money easier, this, I could take this money and grow. So companies are happy as well because they have access to more capital than before. Uh, also, with lower reserve requirements, banks have more freedom to lend that money. So in general, big, big companies uh, would see this as a benefit. In the long term, though, there could be some issues. So we're going to continue this discussion. The be aware or beware tip of the week is be aware of not being informed about these things. It's important to know what's going on proactively. That's part of waking up, being proactive. Many times if you found out when everyone else finds out, you're already behind the eight ball. And understand these regulatory rollbacks that President Trump just signed. Know the investments you have in your accounts. Maybe they're affected by these changes. Know the fiduciary rule changes. We're going to talk about that after the break because you've really got to know your advisor. Or beware, you could end up in another situation where things that happen in the outside world dictates your financial security, and that's not good. You should feel secure in all the things you have in place. You should feel bulletproof. And if you don't, and, and, and you have external circumstances dictating what you've got going on for you, your business, your family, you've got to get proper planning because you can achieve that, okay? And again, when in, if you have any doubt, just reach out. And if you have any questions about how these federal president uh, – presidential changes can affect you or what you've got going on. Call us right now, 888-909-1050. Uh, we're going to go to break. After we're, the break, we're going to continue the discussion. You are listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi, KCA, 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. Alrighty. So a couple weeks ago, I had Barbara Betts from the Betts team on as a guest. And uh, again, to refresh your memory, she runs one of the most successful real estate firms in Southern California. And we announced on that show that we are having a workshop coming up. Uh, and I'm very pleased to announce the details of that wor workshop. It's called Making It Happen. And the whole gist of this workshop is surrounding yourself with a dream team to make your dreams come true, particularly from a real estate side. Uh, but it's important to have all your financials in order, whether you're buying your first home, upgrading your home, finding your final home, your forever home, or downgrading your home in retirement. And the dream team that we put together is a panel. So not only are we going to feed you, but we've got an entire panel of industry experts to help you in all areas of your home upgrade, your sale of your home, anything that has to do with real estate. Okay, so you've got Barbara and Harold Betts who will be there from the Betts team to talk about the markets. You'll have Tony and Wendy Close who are loan officers to talk about mortgages. You'll have Amit Chandel who's a CPA who will talk to you about the tax ramifications of your real estate. And then you'll have Fei Lee who's an estate planning attorney to talk about how to put together the wills and trusts you need. I'll be there as well to talk about how your financial situation can be in alignment with all these other goals. So again, the workshop itself is going to feature this panel. We've got food. There is no cost to the event. It is going to be held March 1st at 6 p.m. at the Old Ranch Country Club in Seal Beach, California. That's March 1st, 6 p.m., the Old Ranch Country Club. You're going to be able to meet us there, ask us whatever questions you have. We're going to keep you up to date, proactive on all this stuff. You've got food, beverages. You can't beat that. Um, we're going to talk about budgeting for your new home, creative ways to get funding for your home, how to handle concurrent sale and purchase, upgrading the home, uh, tax issues that affect the purchase and sale of your real estate, all of that and more. If you're interested, email me, daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. That's daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. It is open to everyone. Again, the workshop is called Making It Happen, March one. 6 p.m., Old Ranch Country Club, beautiful venue in Seal Beach, California. 
join us and uh, let's get back to the show. Okay, so let's keep this ball rolling as I uh, got uh, just talked about the workshop, which is going to really help in terms of being proactive on the real estate side. This is, this is stuff that affects all of us from a regulation standpoint. And in addition to Dodd-Frank and the rollback that was signed by President Trump there, the Department of Labor last year released what was called the fiduciary rule. And this was supposed to be Im implemented by April of this year, 2017. And so what is the fiduciary rule and what is the rollback of that mean? Well, first of all, the fiduciary rule was going to expand the definition of fiduciary. So what is a fiduciary? It means you have to have your client's interest first. What is best for them is what has to happen. You cannot put yourself as an advisor or your compensation above what's at the best interest of the client. And what they wanted to do was expand that definition of fiduciary to anybody that has to do with your retirement, your money. Okay, And, and here's where it made a big difference. There are about 400,000 licensed advisors in the United States. There are probably, according to what I know, less than 400 in the United States that follow the planning techniques and philosophies that I use. And there are less than 250 exit planners in the United States. Okay, Many of these people are licensed as fiduciaries and some of them are not. What that means is some are required to provide you advice that is objective in your best interest with lower fees and lower costs. Some of them are not. So if you don't remember, the first show I ever talked about in, on, in terms of explaining the financial wake-up show was creating an analogy that today's financial industry is like the late 1800s where you had all these quack doctors who would sell like tonics and snake oils and potions that were supposed to make you feel healthy again. And they'd go around in stagecoaches and sell this stuff, claiming that they could cure your, your diseases and things, okay? Well, sooner or later, the government came in and said, okay, we need to have a medical association, medical schools with accredited degrees and designations for the medical field because we can't just have these people going out there claiming that they know what they're doing from a health standpoint. Well, the fiduciary rule was supposed to create a medical degree, per se, for financial professionals. And they, they do exist. They're just not required right now. Okay? So it was to create fiduciary rules when giving advice. And the most affected people or companies, I should say, by this ruling, we're going to be banks and insurance companies because banks and insurance companies have the most people who are not licensed as fiduciary that may give advice. So all of a sudden you take this advice, you go implement it, and it's not so good. Okay? Um, there was going to be a clearer definition of retirement plan advice in general through the fiduciary rule, meaning that if I'm going to advise you on your retirement, I have to clearly understand the pros and the cons of every single advice we give, including the changes in cost you would have, understanding the fees. So it's shocking to me. Many people don't even know how much they're paying fees in their 401ks. It's, it's shocking. But you do pay fees. It's not like there are companies out there that are nonprofit financial companies, okay? They all are for profit. They're all trying to make money. And understanding and giving that in terms of the framework of advice was a big deal with the fiduciary rule. Um, and again, creating clear lines between fiduciary licensed advisors and non-licensed advisors and separating what they could talk about. So I'll give you an example. Uh, you may meet with an insurance agent who makes commentary on your retirement programs. Well, under the fiduciary rule, nah, -uh. you can't have that. You can't have that because that person is not licensed to talk about retirement plans. Okay? And you have to be able to delineate that and create systems. So banks and insurance companies were going to have to spend a lot of money on compliance to either license their employees 
or regulate the discussions that are happening between these uh, agents and bankers and their clients with regards to retirement plan. Now, England and Australia did this many, uh, uh, you know, back in the mid 2000s. And again, the banking and the insurance industries were had to make significant changes. And so the whole industry over the last year has been putting together policies to address this fiduciary rule. The last piece of the fiduciary rule that's really important is commission structures and fee structures, which now have to be in the best interest of a client. So if you have a very charismatic person who can get people to like them for who they are, but maybe doesn't have very good investment or retirement plan advice, you could pay them large, large commissions and fees, move money, pay penalties to move the money, bring it over to that person you like and realize it's not in your best interest. Okay, and there's no real way to test it. These parts of the fiduciary rule are all on pause and again, may not be implemented and they're designed to protect you from misleading, deceptive financial advice and products. My opinion in the long term, I think it's the right thing to do, uh, mainly because I've seen people on the back end when they get sold into wrong products and advice from people that they like. And there's no real way to tell the credentials of who they're getting advice from. So for example, when I go to the doctor, I don't know if they're a good doctor. I mean, maybe I got referred to that doctor, but uh, you know, in his or her office, I see a medical degree. I, I don't know if that, what that meant. Maybe they just barely passed their exams to become a doctor. Maybe they were almost failing as a doctor. Uh, I don't know any of that stuff. And so it's hard for me to tell if the doctor I'm going to is good. Same thing with an advisor, right? So I'm, I'm going to see somebody. How do I know this person, A, has my best interest in, at heart? What are their licenses? All that sort of stuff. In fact, I had a meeting last night with a very, very nice family and they had great questions. And one of them was, how do we know that what you tell us is in our best interest? And it ties exactly to this fiduciary ruling, which we're talking about today. So in a past show, I went over uh, an acronym that I think can help you. Because without the fiduciary rule, that means there's less regulation around this stuff. Uh, that means the responsibility is on you, on you to learn this stuff, to vet your advisor, to find out what you've got going on. And the acronym is GLIDES, G-L-I-D-E-S, G-L-I-D-E-S. Okay, so what do those stand for? G, the first is your gut feeling. You have got to trust your gut feeling. I have clients who have met people and tell me right off the bat they just didn't feel good about who they were talking to. So put your gut feeling above what they're offering, what they're talking about, what you know, anytime you hear this is what you have to do, this is the best thing, this is guaranteed, you know, all this stuff. Put those aside and just trust your gut. So that's what the G stands for. That's number one. L, the second letter, stands for licenses. Find out what licenses they have. You can go to finra.org. That's F-I-N-R-A dot O-R-G. It is the federal, federal government website for the financial regulatory organization called FINRA. And on there, there's a link to something called Broker Check. Broker Check is where you can search by name or license number and find out all the licenses that somebody holds. And those licenses are very important. One of them that ties directly to being a fiduciary and the ethics and the uh, investment advisor piece of what we do is called the Series 66. The Series 66 license will create higher standards for what you need to get from a fiduciary standpoint. Okay. I, which is the third lever, le letter, inventory. Ask your advisor what's in the inventory of products and solutions they can offer. Is it only from one company? Is it from several companies? Where are they pulling the solutions that they're, they're, they're giving to you? Because that can also skew their compensation, but also what they are going to recommend to you. Now, some companies have great products. Some companies have bad products. I can tell you this, there's no one company that is 
dominating in every area. It just doesn't exist. We're in a competitive economy, so there are companies that compete the best way they can. So you want an advisor that has a deep inventory with multiple, multiple options for you to look into because you have to be aware that what they're going to recommend to you is based on their inventory. D, D is the first, a fourth letter. D stands for designations. What, does, what are designations? Well, they're the letters after somebody's name. And the letters after someone's name are important because those exams, A, talk about a lot of complex planning strategies. B, they're not easy. Many of them require hundreds of hours, sometimes several years to achieve. Um, so not everybody gets them. And they also can result in a specialty or an area where somebody is very knowledgeable around. So designations would be the fourth thing I would examine. Number five, E, experience. Experience, it does help to have experience. You know, when you've worked tens of thousands of hours on cases, in my situation, I've been a part of, I feel very lucky to be been a part of over 2,800 cases in my life. You see things and you see patterns and you see unique things that you run into with families. Uh, experience is important. You know, just giving advice and then realizing, wow, there's a tax thing we got to do. There's a legal pr uh, process we have to follow. There's a legal entity we have to send up, set up. These are all really important things to know and understand before giving someone the advice. And then the last letter S, again, the acronym being the acronym being GLIDES. S stands for service model. How often do you talk to your advisor? Uh, I see my clients quarterly. Some see people less, some see people more, although I, I very rarely see someone who talks to their clients more than once a quarter. But if somebody just gave you a financial product and you never heard from them ever again, that is a problem. That's a, that's a, that's a major problem. I have clients who have financial products from decades ago, and my goodness, things have changed. You know, I always say that investment, insurance, products, solutions, they're like cars, right? Cars pick up new features. They have GPS. They have Bluetooth. Some have Wi-Fi now. I mean, cars improve over time. Their engines are better tuned. Um, and, and the same thing happens in the financial industry. Products evolve and change. They can do things for cheaper. They can do things better. They have additional features and more guarantees and opportunities to hedge against losses and all sorts of things. And you should stay on top of those things, not to mention things in your personal situation can change. When those things in your personal situation change, are you proactively talking to your advisor about that? So what's their service model? So again, glides is how I would use to uh, determine the, the, the quality of your potential advisor relationship, gut feeling, licenses, inventory of their products and solutions, designations they have, experience, and their service model. How are they going to keep you in the loop? These are really, really important because, you know, when it comes down to it, A, I would always work with someone you like. B, I would work with someone that from a gut feeling you trust. And then C, you've got to make sure that you're getting the best things in place for you to uh, to achieve everything you want to do. I mean, a lot of clients who are working very hard to save money, uh, sacrificing things they want to do today for a future, for their family, for themselves, for their potential grandchildren. Some already have grandchildren. For business owners, they work very hard for their employees to reward them, to to take care of them, to grow the business. And then you turn around and realize you're paying eight thousand a year in fees that you didn't, you weren't aware of. Uh, you have an allocation in a retirement account that you don't even know how you set up. It's just sitting in there, and then the market tanks, and you wonder why you lost twenty percent. Uh, you have fees that you end up paying from a tax perspective, from a legal perspective, because you weren't aware of certain things. It's it's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're working so hard to make this all happen and then the money sitting there is being eaten away. And that's why I always say if you have any doubt just reach out. 
Daniel at Financial Wake Up Show. People, some of you uh, have questions. There's no need to stay quiet. Find out. Am I doing the right? And if you're doing the right thing, fantastic. I'm happy for you. You should deserve that. You should deserve the best. But to go around wondering, hmm, did I really set that up right? Who do I talk to? Who? Do You've got to understand there's a way and, and this whole fiduciary rule, the reason it came out is because people are not getting the advice they need. They're not being treated fairly. That's why the whole rule was initially proposed. And now it's being ruled back, which you know can benefit in other ways, according to the people who, who believe in that. And, and, and obviously Trump's people believe in that. So, but understand the core issue was I'm not getting advice that's in my best interest for retirement. That was the core issue. I am being charged fees that I'm not aware of. I am paying penalties when I move money, and I'm not aware of these things. I have people who are not licensed properly giving me advice. And that's the core issue of the fiduciary ruling. And you got to understand why it was rolled back, rolled back. Okay? So we're going to take another quick break here. When I get back, uh, I've got another quick mailbag segment, and then we're going to go into our Give More to Get More segment. Uh, you are listening to The Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Troy, KCA 1050 AM, 106.5 FM. All right, folks. So a couple weeks ago when I had Barbara Betts on from the Betts team, again, very successful one of the most successful real estate practices I've seen in Southern California. Uh, she came together and said, let's do something big. Let's get everyone in front of a dream team, a group of people where you can ask whatever questions you want around buying real estate, selling real estate, upgrading your forever home. Let's do it. And I said, that, that sounds like a great idea. So the product of that brainstorming, is a workshop coming up March 1st at 6 p.m. at the Old Ranch Country Club in Seal Beach, California. It's called Making It Happen. Surrounding yourself with a dream team to make your financial dreams come true. And so you're going to have access in a panel-style forum to ask questions to Barbara and Held Betts about the real estate markets, Tony and Wendy Close around mortgages and loans and finding ways to fund your dream purchase, Ahmed Shandell, who will talk to you about anything tax related, the benefits of, the things you got to watch out for from a tax perspective. Fay Lee, who's an estate planning attorney, she will talk to you about the wills and trusts that you need to have in place. Myself, of course, I will be there to answer your questions around how to make all of this align with your current financial situation. You're going to have access to this dream team. We're going to provide you with food and beverages so you'll be taken care of there. It's at a beautiful venue, the Old Ranch Country Club in Seal Beach. It's on March 1st at 6 p.m. We're doing this to educate, to create awareness. So all you have to do is send me an email, register, and you're in. There's no cost to attend the event. We are doing this to create education awareness to wake you up, which is really the premise of our show, the Financial Wake Up Show. Again, March 1st, 2017, 6 p.m., Old Ranch Country Club, Seal Beach, California. The workshop called Making It Happen. Get yourself informed. Surround yourself with a dream team. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and if you're interested, email daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. I look forward to seeing you there. Let's get back to the show. Okay. So let's go back to the mailbag segment, and uh, this is something I've seen two emails about recently. So I'm getting you, – you all are telling me what to talk about, which is great. And the two emails I'm getting about have to do with my topic from last week's show, which is uh, life insurance. So, And really interestingly, these two emails came from clients that have insurance policies from the same company. I'm not going to mention the, the company, but they are permanent policies. So last week I talked about the difference between permanent life insurance and term life insurance. Permanent life insurance has pros and cons. The biggest ones being that there is cash value inside of them that can grow at a tax advantage. And this talks a lot about some of the federal regulations that are changing too in terms of the advice of some of these policies because 
in some of these permanent policies, your cash value is invested in the stock market. And in both these scenarios, both clients didn't even know what investments they had in their life insurances. So I'm looking at these things and in very fine print on a couple of the pages, they both had in there that the policies had a chance of lapsing. What is a lapse? It means the cash value in your insurance policies could go down due to poor market conditions and disappear. And I seriously mean that. The life insurances would disappear. The money that you'd put in for years, sometimes decades, would be gone. And the whole per point of a permanent policy is unlike term, which 99.1% of the time never pays a benefit, with permanent pro policies, you want it to pay a benefit. You want it to go to your family. That's how you use it for advanced planning strategies for estates, for retirement, etc. And if it lapses, all the money you put in is gone. That is not a good thing. That is really not a good thing. So you have to understand the mechanics of the permanent policies you own and what's really going on under the hood there. And there's something really simple you can request from your insurance company. It's called an in-force reprojection. I'll say that again, an in-force reprojection. You call the waiting 800 number, give them your policy number, and say, I'd like an in-force reprojection. And I've had clients do this, and literally right on the illustration itself, it says the policy can come to an end when they're 60 and 70. Why? Because when you're 60 and 70, the cost of insurance keeps going up every year. So your cash value has to keep up with that. And if it doesn't, guess what? Be prepared for a phone call from a life insurance company saying, hey, you need to put in $10,000 to keep this alive or else it'll lapse. So the two email questions I got were to look at those policies and they both came up as potential lapses. You got to be really careful about that. If you have any doubt, just reach out Daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. Okay, every week I highlight a charity to end the show. Why do I do this? Because I don't think you can get more in life without giving more. And so this week on the Give More to Get More segment, I want to welcome Latasha Keel to the show. She's co-founder and director of operation of the Keel Colon Cancer Foundation. And one of the programs they run is called the Kick and Roll Classic. Um, Latasha is a master's prepared registered nurse. She's taken an active role in saving the lives of many Americans for the past seven years at the Level 1 Trauma Center in Central Texas, the University Medical Center at Brackenridge. She's a twice graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. She's uh, been very involved in the medical com community over her many years. She's also married to George Keel. Uh, they got together in 2012, and she fell in love with his family, including George's mother, Deborah. Uh, who passed away. And that passing launched her into the programs that the Keel Colon Cancer Foundation puts on, including her husband's dream of hosting a basketball tournament around sneakers to raise awareness around the disease and, and, and uh, not only create awareness, but to raise money and do a lot of good things. So, Latasha, I want to welcome you to the Financial Wake Up Show. How are you this morning? I'm doing just fine. Thanks so much for having us on. Absolutely. Uh, I was registered to go to the Kick and Roll Classic out here in Southern California at the uh, Stance Sox, Sox headquarters, and I wanted to create some awareness around your program. So what's the mission of the Keel Colon Cancer Foundation? Um, so our mission is to decrease the number of preventable deaths that are caused by colon cancer, and we accomplish that through um, education and awareness initiatives. We encourage healthy lifestyle choices, and we support colon cancer research. All very, uh, very important things. And and I noticed there's some background, some history to the the setup of this foundation. Can you give our listeners a little background and history of the Keel Colon Cancer Foundation? Um, absolutely. So uh, back in 2014, um, actually I will go even back further than that. So after we got married, uh, George and I, we went on our honeymoon, and right when we got back, we found out that his mom had gotten diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, and so she underwent a surgery and started chemotherapy. And at that time, the doctor had told her that, uh, you know, she made it through the chemotherapy. She probably had like two years to live. Um, 
which we were really saddened by, but we didn't know at the time that when they caught the colon cancer, it was already stage four. Um, and so wow. we watched her, you know, fight this terrible disease. And unfortunately, you know, she didn't live to tell her story about it. Um, and so she ended up passing away in March 2014. Um, and at that time, uh, George was getting ready to do a basketball tournament. He has a really big sneaker following from his work that he did at Night Kick. And so um, we decided at that time that we were going to move forward with the basketball tournament, but instead of it just being about sneakers, that we were actually going to have a, like, a really significant cost behind it. And so we wanted to, to reach out to people, to tell as many people as we could about colon cancer and how it's one of the most beatable, treatable, and preventable cancers out there. And I don't think that a lot of people even talk about it. And so we thought that that would be a great uh, opportunity to get the word out. Sure. And it's a really fun concept. Uh, you know, it's, it's about uh, not, not just raising money for this, but uh, for any, anybody who enjoys basketball and the sneaker culture and, and, and getting involved that way, it, it's a great concept. Now, what areas does your foundation support uh, and, and where do you need help? How do our listeners get involved? Oh, we have so many things going on. So um, we are all about being in the community. We're all for our community. And so I think one of the things that kind of sets us apart from other organizations that um, they focus primarily on, okay, now that you've been diagnosed, what do we do? What support and resources do we have? And I think that's awesome like that. That's a really great thing for them to do. But for us, I think we are focusing more on prevention. So we sat down and did a lot of research to figure out, like, what do they know about colon cancer? What can, what is the message that we need to get out here, you know, to give to the to the community? And mm -hmm. um, one thing that we found out was that if there are a lot of modifiable risk factors, and the majority um, of those are are centered around diet and exercise. And I'm just like, oh man, you know, what if we really focus our our efforts on prevention. So let's get out here and talk to people about preventing colon cancer. So let's, mm -hmm. let's diet, let's exercise, let's, let's maintain healthy lifestyles early. So maybe once we get further on down the line, we don't have to deal with these issues at all. And so I think, again, that's what sets us apart from other organizations, and we're really, really about teaching prevention, getting your colonoscopy at the right time, asking appropriate questions to your doctors mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, as far as what we do for the community, we have several events, um, primarily the Kick and Roll Class. That's our biggest event. And um, mm -hmm. we do that every year at the, here in Austin at the Ron Rock Sports Center. Um, we also have um, a lot of events sitting around the month of March because March is Colon mm -hmm. Cancer Awareness Month. And we oh. didn't notice at the time when his mom passed away and been passing away in the, in the month, like, just out of coincidence, but mm -hmm. um, some of the things that we do for the community. So the kick and roll classes, when we decided that we were going to go ahead and do it, we announced it on Mother's Day that same year that his mom passed away. Um, mm -hmm. We opened registration up on June 6th, which was li little less than a month after um, we announced it. And we literally only had social media presence for our event. And less than three months after we announced it, we ended up having an event and over 500 people showed up. And it was funny because wow. after that, everyone was all like, when's y'all's next event? And we're like, oh, I, we hadn't really even thought that far. You know, it was just kind of fresh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something that we were doing at the time. And so from that is where the, the idea for the nonprofit foundation actually in, ended up being birthed. And so from that, we've um, spurred into all these different initiatives that we have. Um, all right, so as far as how people can help us, come out to the Classic, join mm -hmm. our social media. Um, we have a Twitter page, Instagram, and Facebook. We're at Kill Colon okay. Cancer on those all different forms there. Help us spread okay. the word. We have a huge Blue Knot initiative um, that we came up with last year where we we're trying to think, like, we always hear about breast cancer and you see pink and um, childhood cancers and What's something that we can can do that can get help us get the word out? And so we already had a really huge sneaker following. We're teaching about um, diet and exercise. And I'm like, wait a minute, to exercise, 
kind of have to have sneakers on. This is all, you know, it's all full circle here. And so George mm-hmm. came up with the idea of uh, Blue Knots, which are blue shoelaces that um, have the Kill Colon Cancer Foundation logo and our motto mm-hmm. on there. And essentially our goal is together we, we can tie together the Kill Colon Cancer. Lace up your sneakers, get out there, and get moving. Um, and so mm-hmm. we have Blue Knots that are like available. That. You don't want to be without your Blue Knots in the month of March because this initiative has really taken off. We've had NBA teams. Wearing our uh, shoelaces, the Baylor Bears were wearing them um, in a few of their mm-hmm. games last year, and we're hoping that this year is going to be even better and, and bigger. That's fantastic. Um, also, we have the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just think that's this is an amazing way to build something and and memorialize uh, George's mother. It's just fantastic. So. Um, you know, one last question, Latasha. What's what's been the re- most rewarding aspect for you in building this and seeing the support you're getting from from everyone around this and, and some of the progress you've made? Um, I would say that um, once we got into the nonprofit foundation world, we didn't really know how much work it was it would involve, and um, it is a lot of work. Right? I can't even begin to tell you how much work it is, but um, we go to an event and we have someone come up and say, you know, my daughter dragged me out here to come to this basketball game. I didn't know what she was talking about, but um, I'm so glad that I came because I went and I had my colonoscopy done and they found three polyps. Thank you so much for getting the word out because I had no idea. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. to me, that makes it all worth it. We get emails all the time from people not even in the United States, outside of the United States that are telling us, you know, we watch you guys on social media, you know, the stuff that you guys are saying is so encouraging, or, you know, I signed up to get my colonoscopy, or, you know, I'm out here, I'm working out, I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I live this healthy life because I don't want to fall down, you know, that same pathway. Uh, one of the things that's the, 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 I guess, the biggest piece for me is we love, love, love George's mom so much. You know, sometimes you hear... Um, people talk about, like, in-laws and outlaws and that kind of thing. And I will say that that woman truly embraced me from the moment she met me. Um, and she never got a chance to meet her granddaughter. And oh. it hurts me to my core because she would have been such an awesome grandmother, and she won't ever get that opportunity. And so for us, it's about allowing, um, giving us a chance, a voice to put the word out there. So maybe that doesn't happen to someone else in their family. Right. Well, Latasha, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful story, this great organization and all the work you're doing. For our li- our listeners, again, it's K-I-E-L, Kiel Colon Cancer, on all social media networks. Uh, find them, follow them, support them. Uh, some amazing good things going on. And again, uh, I, see, I see this every week, people doing amazing things for our communities. We just need to get out there and get involved. Latasha, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a great Saturday. You too. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. And so here we are at the end of another show. We talked about some big things today. We talked about the federal government, the regulations happening there, some of Trump's initiatives and how that might affect you. We talked about uh, the email questions I got around life insurance and how you might want to make sure you've got the right thing going on. Amazing story from Keel Collins at the answer this morning. You know, reach out, talk to us. The 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 message, uh, the email, excuse me, Daniel at financialwakeupshow.com. Our website is financialwakeupshow.com. You can go there, check us out. Our social media is at tfwus. Make sure you ask questions through that. Um, and again, every week we're going to bring refreshing new content. I hope you found what we shared today to be helpful. We got more guests coming up for the rest of the the, the year, so I'm looking forward. Until next Saturday, I wish you health wealth and prosperity you've been listening to the financial wake-up show on kca 1050 am and 106.5 fm guardian its subsidiaries agents and employees do not provide tax legal or accounting advice consult your tax legal or accounting professional regarding your individual situation all investments contain risk and may lose value daniel Choi, chartered retirement planning counselor and certified exit planner is a registered representative financial advisor of park avenue securities llc securities products and advisory services offered through pas member finra sipc financial representative of the guardian life insurance company of america guardian new york new york pas is an indirect wholly 